I've had the privilege of being in and around banking for more than 50 years. Lots of changes during that time. We've gone from ledgers to laptops, typewriters to technology. One thing, however, remains the same. Banking is a people business, and I'll be talking with those people that make banking great here on Jack Rats with Modern Bankers. Welcome to Jack Rants with Modern Bankers, brought to you by RELPRO and Vertical IQ. Each week I feature top voices in financial services, from bankers and consultants to best-selling authors and many more. The goal of this program is simple, to provide insights, success practices, and to bring new ideas to the table that you can use to maximize your results. My guest today is Lauren Sparks. I met Lauren when I was speaking at a Sheshinoff conference several years ago, and we've stayed connected ever since. Lauren is a graduate of Colgate University and was a senior director at Sheshinoff Consulting. She owns her own very successful risk management company, 3RP, and she's really involved in the community bank movement from a variety of perspectives, from risk, compliance, and many other operational issues but she decided to move on to banking. She filed papers to start Agility Bank in 2019, and the capital raise began right when the pandemic did in 2020. Now, despite that, she and her team raised more than $40 million in capital, and the bank opened its doors in 2022. This is a great, great entrepreneurial story and a fascinating interview with a great banker. It's Lauren Sparks on Jack Rants with Modern Bankers. And here we go. So as I mentioned, I, I met Lauren a number of years ago and uh, as a consultant, and uh, she stepped out and did something quite unique uh, and exciting. And we're going to talk about that today. But Lauren, uh, uh, as I always like to start the program, uh, tell me something good. Well, you know, I had to think about it because sometimes when you've got your head down in the heat of the moment of a startup, you know, I had to think about it. But I actually it was yesterday afternoon and it's work related, but it was uh, we had a director loan committee. So a, a loan committee for some larger deals and it went off without a hitch. The directors were on the same page. The lenders were on their game. Credit had done great jobs on the credit memos. Everybody was in sync. It went like that. One, two, three. And I thought, oh the team, you know, there's the team. It doesn't happen every day. So I, I, we all actually, when the meeting was over, several of us just sat around and cherished the moment because when you, it's banking's a team sport. And when the team works, it was like, wow, that's what we're building. So it was really a nice moment. Thank you for letting me share it because I really had to think about it to come up with it for you. Well, you've built a great team and five out of the six of your board members, outside board members are females, which I want to mm -hmm. delve into because you have such a unique organization. But before we get into Agility Bank, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, you and I met in my consulting space, right? So I was in a community bank for about nine years, sort of saw that I wasn't going to go any further than where I was in that environment here in Texas. Um, but people started saying, well, why don't you come here and do this? Why don't you come here and do that? And I thought about going to law school and didn't do that because I had enough work going on. So I started local consulting and then regional firm and then ended up at Sheshnoff where I met you doing all kinds of fun things in my mind for banks, mostly risk management and compliance consulting uh, and really getting inside. I can't even imagine how many banks it is now. Like in your career, I can't imagine how many banks you've been inside, but uh, hundreds. It's, it's, Hundreds. Yeah, it's probably close to hundreds for me, too. But uh, and, in the, and in the last 12 or 13 years, I started my own firm uh, of regulatory consulting for community banks. And so that's really what I've been doing. It's banking all the way. And I just love it. Well, you you loved it enough to <laughs> get this idea to start a bank. Um, what was going on in your mind and what, what clicked for you that finally said, OK, I'm doing this? I think, you know, I think I talked to you way early on because I was talking to people about, I wanted somebody to tell me I was crazy. A couple of people did, but, but I don't think you did. Uh, but I think that I love banking. I love community banks. And when you've been in enough of them and in enough communities, you see the impact they have and you realize how important they are to the fabric of the economy. And you're like, oh my gosh, 
this is great. I'm so glad I'm a part of it. And then when I started to see the consolidation happening, I, I became very fearful about this whole conversation of we only need one or two banks or we only need a central bank or all this. It just would be so bad for our economy uh, and for the people I know who run businesses and who are entrepreneurs. That was one level of the discussion in my head about we really need more community banks and this consolidation is not necessarily good. And then I started to realize as I'm aging that women still haven't really found their place in that community bank environment. We all, you know, 75% of the women who are people in the bank are women who do the work, but they don't always get to the C-suite. They certainly hardly ever get to an equity position in those banks. When those banks do sell, they're not in the position to to do anything but try to find themselves a new job. So that inequity thing was kind of glaring at the same time. And those two things sort of created a perfect storm of me saying somebody needs to start this bank, somebody needs to start a woman-owned, women-led bank. And when nobody did it, I just sort of found people who would do it with me. Amazing. And um, when, when was that? When did that all kind of come to fruition in your mind? Well, I'm trying to think. I probably talked to you in 19. I think I probably talked to you about it in 19. In 18, I had to fig start figuring out what I was going to do about my business because I own a business and I had to figure out what to do about that. So I started talking to people in late 18, 19, it sort of solidified, this is what I was gonna do. And the regulatory part didn't bother me because my background's regulatory. Um, but uh, so it was really a year and a, a little over a year of talking to people that I respected and knew and getting some feeling from people of what they thought. And then uh, we really only filed uh, March of 20, which was, interesting timing because that was the whole beginning of the pandemic really we're well, not the beginning but the part where we acknowledged it and started shutting down well you raised 43 million dollars in capital during the pandemic how did you do that well talk about a team right uh the thing about this bank is we wouldn't be here if, if there weren't a lot of people who really believed in what we believe in which is you can do good things and good business in the same space and that women deserve an opportunity to be in charge of financial services um, to start to create more parity or equity in the environment. Um, you know, one thing, if you if you look at community banks in your town, uh, wherever you are, uh, most of them, I would suspect all of them, are majority owned by men and run by men. And there is nothing wrong with that. But until we start to do some of what we're doing, we aren't going to be able to engage people and bring them into the places where they have the career opportunities, where they can become um, members at the same table and, and where there's really more financial parity and going on because where the decisions are made is where the power is. That's who grants access to capital. That's how people get ahead. That's what makes change. So um, anyway, it's, it was going on for a while and uh, the pandemic was definitely a challenge. Uh, we thought we had it figured out. Um, and then the, the first week that we really went out to market and said, okay, we're going to dial for dollars this week. We had a big freeze here in Houston and all the power was out. We didn't even have our phones charged. It was just like, oh, <laughs> but we, we got there. So. Well, you got there in, in a, in a very unique way because you had to do this one-on-one -on -one dialing for dollars because you yeah. couldn't see people. But some of the stories that I've heard you tell about how, you know, women certainly are were were all in with you in, in terms of stockholders, but there were also men who said, you know, for my daughter, for my granddaughter, tell tell us those. Well, that, those were the conversations. I mean, that was I really so I'm so naive. I am so naive. I thought, oh, we just talk to like minded women. We raise the capital. Bing, bang, it's done. No problem. Well, you know, first of all, I realized that I am a risk taker, which I never thought. Um, most women are not. And, um, and, and then talking to women about investing in a bank is a whole different conversation. It's an educational process because women do not traditionally get the invitation to invest in a bank. So it's a whole different conversation. Um, uh, I think that uh, the best part of all of this was realizing that there were just as many men who came forward and said, I want to do this, as you said, I want to do this for my granddaughter. I want to do this for my daughter. I want to do this so that um, they have a, the, a different world to be in than maybe my wife did, or maybe my mother did. And, and that's the really, and we have several women who also did this as legacy plays for their, for their grandchildren, uh, to, to, and they're engaged. Uh, 
one of the women that's an investor here, uh, she's already earmarked her investment for her grandchildren. And they they ask her all the time, Grammy, how's the how's the bank doing? How's our bank doing? And um, so it's really um, a kind of a family environment in some ways. But it, this was an organic grassroots raise. So again, different um, investment banks were wary to work with us on it. It was a bad time, bad, bad risk. But it, it isn't at the end of the day. But you did it and you raised a ton of money mm -hmm. and you could have done this anywhere in the country. Why did you pick Houston? Well, I live here. I've lived here. I came here right after college. So this is where my home is. It's also where uh, I worked uh, as a consultant for probably, I tried to list them the other day, about 10 or 12 de novo banks where I was in with them on the ground floor, part of their process, understanding what they were doing. And so it felt like the right place for me, but that's personal on a completely economic basis. Oh my gosh, Texas economy, I mean, despite COVID, continues to grow and prosper. All the projections are incredible. I could sit in our temporary space uh, during COVID while we were raising capital and see cranes working. I mean, nothing stopped. And they were even building restaurants, restaurants open, nothing stopped. It's just a very vibrant economy. It's also, um, you know, the wild west still in many ways. So entrepreneurship is a big deal. Outstanding. Well, you, you talked about your team. Uh, and uh, when I went on your website to look, I think I counted of the 25 employees you had at the time, and you may have more now, 21 of them were female. Mm -hmm. um, you've got some interesting stories about some folks that actually came out of retirement. So mm -hmm. talk about your team a little bit, how you found them, and how you're recruiting bankers now. Well, I'm, I'm lucky in that since banking is my background and I've worked with so many great bankers that in order to, to build a core team of starting the bank, I, I knew people who um, really had some tremendous experience. So, um, for example, our chief operating officer, this is her third de novo and our acting chief financial officer. It's his third, second or third de novo. So, I mean, they had experience and I you have to have this kind of gray haired experience to get approved. You have to know what you're doing. Um, but that's not where banking's going. And one of the things I wanted us to be was uh, re relevant as a community bank of the future, understanding technology, understanding the things that needed to change about community banking to keep us competitive and keep us moving forward and keep us a part of that, a valid part of that economic fabric. So um, I thought, how am I gonna do that? We need to bring people along in banking and it's not sexy, right? I always say that all the time, it's really not sexy, but boy, is it a great career. And how do we get people to come in? And I thought, well, maybe, it's like anything, if you see somebody and you have a mentoring process, I think that's a very effective way of bringing people into an environment. So um, our uh, uh, head of marketing is Sarah Peterson. She came out of retirement just because she believed in what we were doing. Um, and so she's our first generational dream team. We paired her with a young woman right out of marketing, uh, with a marketing degree right out of the University of Houston. And it's been so fun to watch them. They've developed a tremendous non-work relationship as well, but their work relationship is really fun. Uh, they help each other. Uh, we fully expected that Sarah would impart some incredible knowledge to Eden over the years. Uh, they've been working together about two and a half years now, or maybe close to three. But the really fun part is that Eden teaches all of us with a perspective that we don't have. And uh, so we're trying to do that more and more with, you know, I'm paired with a couple of younger bankers, the poor things, but um, it, it's, it's just an interest. It's trying to build a culture as well, right? You can build a bank with numbers and, and reconcile on some things, but building the culture of the bank is the other piece. And, and so we're hoping that that generational dream team environment also creates a, a pathway for talent to want to come here and stay here. Yeah. And I want to I want to dive into that a little bit, uh, too. But, you know, every bank has and we're seeing this more and more in banks as they merge or they change their branding and what have you. And they change their name from First National or Second National or whatever. Agility Bank is such a unique name. And uh, I'm just curious how y'all came up with that name. Well, it's funny because we, we also know stories of large banks that have paid millions of dollars to get new names and you go, mm -mm. it really was just a couple of us sitting around talking. Uh, we probably, me and two or three trusted friends uh, sitting around talking about what's a name that imparts 
we're not old, we're not stuck in the mud, we're moving forward, and we're always part of what's important to our client. And so it had to denote movement. It had to be something that made sense in a collaborative kind of way. And when you start to understand the whole agile, collaborative work environment of not being stuck in a position, but being willing to move forward and test and move forward and test, it just sort of spoke to who we wanted to be uh, as a bank, as a bank that was able to be part of the future as opposed to stuck in the past, which is what most people think about banks, uh, unfortunately. But the, I do tell people that there was probably a little bit of wine involved in some conversations like that. It's never bad. It's never <laughs> wrong. Hope not. Uh, you have uh, 51% of your stockholders are females. That allowed you to, to get MDI status. Now, that was when I heard this and when I researched this, it was very new to me. What, what is an MDI and what does that do for your bank? So a minority depository institution, an MDI, is a specially designated charter for a bank who um, has a mission or a, a requirement to make sure it's uh, addressing or serving a certain segment of an underserved banking community. So uh, I've known about MDIs for a while. I've helped MDIs in the past as clients. And it was part of the original plan to be an MDI, a woman-owned, women-led financial institution from day one. That was part of who we wanted to be, part of our business plan. And we're actually closer to 66%, I think, uh, female-owned. Uh, and within that, we have some really cool um, LLCs that are another group of 30 uh, business owners who didn't want to put in the minimum individually, so they came together as a group. So we have some really neat ownership of the bank. Uh, but it creates a great opportunity because um, minority depository institutions have a mission and it's aligned with Community Reinvestment Act in, in many ways. So when we partner with another financial institution, uh, that financial institution gets CRA credit for working with us. And we truly believe that the fact that our mission is based on women owned and what's become minority owned business, because that's our focus, uh, we can reach deeper in the community than a larger bank can. And so their partnering, their partnering initiatives with us just make more sense. So already we've had some great partners. Um, we have four banks that have purchased our stock. They don't have any majority ownership. They don't have anybody on the board. They don't have anything like that. They've done it strictly as a CRA investment. And they're part of, they saw us, they saw our team, they liked our mission, they liked what we were about and they invested in the bank. Huge. I mean, what a great partnership. Um, and and it benefits them and it truly benefits us. They can also do things like do loan participations with us, buy and sell. So initially, they were purchases we were making of loan participations, and we knew that was part of our business plan. Um, those banks that sold those participations to us, they get CRA credit. But now we're beginning to do the opposite, and there's CRA credit involved there too. And then also in terms of deposits, which at this point in time, it's nice when somebody wants to place a deposit with us um, instead of all the money running to the top three banks. But uh, uh, they get CRA credit for that too. And then, the, then sitting here today, there's initiatives around that that we haven't even thought of yet. But I, we have a strategic partnership with a couple large financial institutions on everything to offering um, uh, with J.P. Morgan Chase offering empowerment funds for uh, money market investments for companies that have that as a strategy for their shareholder initiatives for DEI uh, to. Uh, Bank of America opening their ATMs to us, to our to our clients. I mean, it's just, there's different ways that we've found. And I, like I said, there's probably more ways going forward that are opportunities to really have an impact. So we're not getting giveaways. It's not like we don't pay taxes. People say that, what, do you not pay taxes? Do you get grants? No, we're a bank just like everybody else, but we have a unique opportunity to have partnerships. It is, it is a wonderful situation. Well, you, so here you are in your consulting firm, and maybe you had a couple of employees or associates or whatever, and mm -hmm. you get up every morning and you got to make payroll, you got to make your clients happy, and that's one thing. But now you're the CEO of a bank, and you have employees and associates and stockholders. You, as a CEO in a community bank, wear a ton of hats. How do you go about getting things done during the day? Oh, you and I have had that conversation a few times. <laughs> yes, we have. So I, I don't know that I've cracked any code on it. And I certainly run around with my hair on fire a lot, but the, the, you just, it's a lot of reacting at this point. I, I can't wait. I mean, we're a year, we're only 14 months in. So we're still reacting to a lot of things. 
I find that I do have some days now where I'm less reactive and more proactive. And I think that that's where I hope to get to sooner. It's definitely a different experience uh, from running your own business, being your own boss. You do exactly what you want to do every day um, to having a board that you're accountable to and shareholders. And while the shareholder accountability doesn't bother me, the board accountability is a little bit of a change of, um, you know, there's a hierarchy that I wasn't used to. And so that's that's been, you know, a good learning curve for me. Uh, the regulatory piece doesn't bother me at all. I'm used to that. And uh, it's been my career. So uh, following those rules and all that doesn't bother me. But it's definitely a different experience. And um, I think it was when when I ended up, when I had, so as I still own my consulting firm, I can't do anything in it. I don't know what they really do. I still own it. Uh, but when we got to the point at the bank that I had more employees, when I when we hit 13, when I had more employees at the bank than I had at the firm, I started to go, ooh. You know, <laughs> that's a tremendous responsibility in a different way. Yeah. Uh, how I'm curious, you're so you launched your business and you built it because you're good at sales in addition to the other things that you're good at. Oh, you're uh, fine. I'm curious how much you're able to get out with customers, because as a CEO of a bank, of a community bank, I would think that would be really powerful. Well, I, I, you know, that is, that is our, been our, our challenge and, and resources have been our challenge. And I'm sure you had that conversation with everyone. Um, people are a little wary about signing on with a startup, especially during COVID. People are a little wary of uh, a less traditional financial institution. So it's been an interesting challenge to bring the team to get the right team amassed. And so We've made some strategic hires and that now is going to afford me to get out more, but I do get out. I mean, I, I attend things. I handle a lot of um, clients first up, you know, I'm the first conversation and I get the deal information and I handle, you know, sort of a strategy conversation and then I hand off. So I, I'm very involved uh, with a lot of the clients and I love being out and about because I love working with people. I, I just don't know why you wouldn't want to bank here. I just don't know why you wouldn't want to. Of course, and that, yeah, and you have to feel that conviction if you're going to be successful. Well, you mentioned non-traditional, and one of the things you and I talked about as you were building the bank out was your ability to kind of start from scratch with technology. So, talk about some of the technology that that that's going on in your organization now. Well, and that's part of the conversation I heard a lot from my clients in the consulting side was the community bank saying, "Well, I can't afford to be competitive. I can't afford." to <clears throat> to provide those services. I can't, and some of it is can't, and some of it is won't. And, and what I realized was that I, I, and then several investors said, why don't you just go buy an existing charter of an existing bank? And I did not want to do that. I did not want to buy the technology. I didn't want to buy the culture. I didn't want to buy any of that. I wanted to start fresh, like you said, and say, this is the community bank of the future. What does it look like? Well, it's an agile stack of technology and trying to find, you know, we went with a smaller core, uh, because of their ability to be flexible with us. And we've partnered with FinTech Solutions uh, to, to create a, you know, what we felt was an interesting tech stack. And some of our choices have been great. Some of our choices haven't been so great. We, you know, we are learning as we go. Um, and, it, and it is difficult to find uh, all the right technology that plays together well, because you get a lot of this finger pointing between all of them. Yes, we'll play together and then they won't. Um, so, you know, that's an interesting experience, but I think the the idea is that we continue to change whatever we have to in the stack to be flexible uh, and to figure out what business tools are appropriate because we're primarily a business bank. What are the business tools that are appropriate for our businesses? And I, I can tell you that things that I thought were going to be like, because it would have been cool for me as a business owner, just aren't necessarily flying. And so we're re retooling and changing our focus as we go. Nothing Nothing that we thought would be when we filed our application in March of 2020 is the reality of where we are sitting here for any bank, really, in um, in August of, can you believe it's August? August of 23. And, but the good news is because of your size, you are agile and mm -hmm. you have the ability to do what bigger banks, even a $200 million, $300 million mm -hmm. bank can't do because they're locked into contracts. So that does give you a lot of flexibility. So I, I remember when Bob St. Meyer and I started St. Meyer and Hubbard, uh, and we were talking about it in, in 1999. And my wife said, well, what kind of business are you looking for from banks? I said, the ones that write us a check. 
Um, so you, you can't be terribly picky when you're a brand new company, but I got to believe that as you started this out, because you mentioned you're really targeting commercial, I, I got to believe that as you started this out, you, you and your board and your team said, okay, these are the kind of verticals that I sort of want to go after proactively. What are some of those without revealing a whole lot of confidences? Well, it's interesting because what I think with any de novo bank is you look at your shareholder base because that's your first place you go for growing the bank. And when you when we look at our shareholder base, we have some very specific uh, types of of investors, and um, they're in certain industries and there's certain profiles of a professional, you know, executive and professional, and they are entrepreneurs and business owners, and that they like community banks because they like to have the ability to walk in and talk to the CEO or text her or, or call her. I mean, everybody in the world's got my cell number and that's fine. That's what the community bank's about and they want that kind of accessibility. And so, uh, you know, we're executive and professional medical. You look at the Houston market, it's just a, such an incredibly varied market in the medical uh, um, profession and um, industry. And then, um, you know, of course, commercial real estate is definitely a big deal for uh, community banks. The The interesting thing is that based on the market as it currently is, we're getting to look very selectively at things because mm. that's the market. So we can be very selective in what we do do. And, every, and, and others are pulling back from commercial real estate, right. which gives you an opportunity to do some more looks that maybe you wouldn't have had. Exactly. I think... You know, everything happens the way it's supposed to. And some of the timing, particularly in this market, is probably going to be, when we look back, we'll go, wow, that's really what gave us that that bump there or that bump there or, or that opportunity there. And so, uh, you know, out of everything, and, and we've said this is, bef the, and this is the board has agreed and our, our founding investors have agreed from the very beginning, because we could have stopped in our tracks with COVID. We could have stopped, but we all acknowledged and we all understand, and I think most of us are entrepreneurs, that's why out of disruption comes opportunity. So that's what our focus is, is where, you know, we see all this happening and what's our opportunity out of that. No doubt. Well, you, you mentioned Eden, and I'm, I'm, I, 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 the reason I bring her up is I was looking at your LinkedIn homepage and it is, is really, really outstanding. And by the way, you should all go to the Agility Bank homepage, follow Agility Bank. Oh, you're so kind. It's, it's great. Um, I'm, I'm curious, because you are so young, you've also got some younger bankers. I'm curious how they're using LinkedIn as they're doing their business development activities. Well, it's interesting because you can't, generalized. You can't think that everybody that's younger than you is better on LinkedIn than you are. Because there's still some people who are not as tech savvy. Um, and um, but they're but they're using it really well and they'd like to engage in it. And, it. and it's also part of I think culture building. They're excited about what they read and see because they don't always know where I am. They don't always know what we're up to. We're small and you can yell down the hall and and, and most everybody will hear it, but we don't always yell about everything down the hall. So we don't always know. Um, so, I mean, I think it, we don't have an intranet currently, and it helps us all communicate in that way about knowing what's up. Um, they like being an extension of the bank. They like, even when they're not client-facing people, they like being uh, an extension of the marketing of the bank. And so there's an enjoyment in them being able to share like that. And I do know, because we've compared ourselves to other banks, our size, other Genovo banks in the market, and even other Genovo banks nationally, and, and we have a a pretty darn good um, uh, uh, presence on LinkedIn, and that's Eden. And she spends time training the board, and she spends time with any of the employees that need help. And so we can always be better, but we're doing pretty good. And she's been, it's funny because I'll be out and about talking to people, and they say, We see you everywhere. They don't mean they see me, they see the bank everywhere. And that's because of social media. And that is the great equalizer, the ability to be sitting in an office, providing content, providing value, looking at the verticals that you're wanting to get involved in and targeting them and providing value to them. 
That is so powerful. That's great. Well, you, I, well I gotta, we're looking forward to working more with you, Jack, on that. <laughs> well, that would be, you know, that would be a real privilege. Uh, and, and I'm I'm real proud of our Mastering LinkedIn for Bankers class. And it's just mm -hmm. going really well. We had a story the other day from a banker who took our, our, our class and, and said, gee, I, I reconnected with five people and I've got five appointments and I never would have had them without the class. So yeah, lo love to look forward to working with you yes. and others in yes. that regard. But you, you talked about this very unique uh, uh, approach called generational dream teams. You alluded to it a little bit, but talk more about it and how did that all start? Well, it's really me sitting there saying we have to find a way to bring people into this bank. I want to retire someday and I want to hand off the reins to a really great team who knows what they're doing, understands who we are, and is going to drive us forward. And how am I going to how am I going to do that? So it's very selfishly a retirement plan. But on another level, it's how do we bring people in? Because I have to be OK with bringing people in and and mentoring them and, and them learning and they go somewhere else because it's all about stronger um, bankers in the community banking system. Uh, so I have to be OK with that, as I remind myself. But uh, it really was an idea I had. And and I said, we have to have a culture that's around creating opportunities for women in financial services. So whether it's with us or somewhere else, we start changing who's at the table making the decisions around financial services and access to capital. It's 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 just a terrific idea. Well, thanks. And here's another thing that you, you have talked about a couple of times, and it's such a unique opportunity for a startup bank, DeNovo, is that your board is made up of the same kind of folks that our stockholders, which is women. Five of the six board members are women. I'm curious how you found them and what are some of their responsibilities? Well, we're actually up to eight now. So six of the eight are women, um, okay. two men. And, uh, you know, they come from varied backgrounds. So um, the majority of them are entrepreneurs or have had entrepreneurial experience. So they understand what it is to be banked as a business. They understand what it is to have a good bank partner to grow their businesses. So they help remind us all the time of what our focus is and who we're trying to serve. Um, many of them also have some financial services experience, especially uh, one, two, one, two, three of the women. And that's huge because they've lived what I'm talking about, you know, hitting a ceiling, only getting so far, understanding that they weren't at the table to make the next next decision, that kind of thing. So they've lived it. You know, I guess I guess what it is is they they are we're a great representation of what we're trying to serve and address in in the market um and their role boy as a director of a startup or a de novo bank it's a lot of work our director loan committee meets sometimes every week uh so there's homework before every meeting looking at the deals uh we are of course we have our board meetings but there's a lot of homework because uh we do everything we do is the first time at least once right so everybody's learning all the time. This is our first, this kind of deal. This is the first time we've had to do a resolution about this. This is the first time we've entered it in this kind of agreement. And uh, and we don't pay uh, director fees as a startup. And so it's a it's a mission of, um, of serving what they truly believe uh, the bank will be doing here in, in the community for a long time. It's a labor of love for the community as well. You've developed something called Agility Achieve, um, which is phenomenal. Talk about that. Well, and, and so, okay, Agility Achieve is the first part of what we're trying to do in terms of education. So what I realized during the capital raise was things I know are be only because I'm a banker. And 99% of the rest of the world doesn't know these things. And some of that they need to know because it can impact their success. So like the opportunity about investing in bank stock, explaining that to women and why that made sense. And, and yes, you can do that through your IRA. And this is a great thing for you to think about. You should think about all these things in, as a woman in, in that way, um, but in totality, and you should be exposed to these decisions and these opportunities. So in that way, we realized education was a big deal just raising the capital. But then when we're getting down to 14 months of making loans, or we have a digital lending platform, Numerated has been an incredible partner for us, incredible partner for us. And here we are trying to do small business lending on a digital platform and, and increase access to capital. And it's hard because these business owners might be good business owners, but their credit score isn't there. So then you, you stop and you have to retread and say, I want to help that person. I can't. What that person really needs is education. And there's a lot of 
pieces of that out there. And I and and while so I've we've really been struggling internally with we can't be everything to everyone and we can't be the oracle of all education, but we can provide some education. And that's what Agility Achieve is. It's some educational opportunity. It's a digital process. It's through our website. Um, eventually, we'll probably do some certification around it and some loan discounts around that. But it's our first effort at education because that's when we learn we can do things differently or better. And I think it's just the beginning of that. I, I truly believe our purpose or best way to serve in that educational field is going to be harnessing in some way all the initiatives that are out there because there's a million initiatives around education for small business owners. How do you harness that and make that clear to somebody so they know what they need and, and how to get it? It's I feel like there's all these disparate things out there and great initiatives, but it's not a cohesive list of information, a hub of information for a business owner to know what to do next. We're doing a lot of that one-on-one, -on -one, but mm -hmm. there's there's got to be a better way to do that. And it's probably going to just do nothing but grow. You'll, you'll expand it, change it, modify it. and it's, That's it, what we have to do. And I think that everything we do, we realize we have to, and that's the agile name, right? That's about, okay, that didn't work. We're going to tweak it this way. This is what we wanted to do. It didn't have the expected results. How are we going to get there? And uh, it's just always changing, which for bankers is very hard, right? Right. Bankers like things very set, strong framework, nothing changes. And here we are saying, here's a bank that's willing to keep changing. Yeah. And you're also not only changing, but you're running. And you <laughs> and your team are running every single day. So, so you have a story about red sneakers. What's the deal with red sneakers? With our red high tops. Well, uh, we, we we the capital raise took us a while through the pandemic. And so we kept saying it wasn't a sprint. Most other people's capital raises are a sprint and ours was a marathon. And so, you know, it's all team building stuff. Uh, I, I, I don't know even where it came from. Somebody laughed about, oh, we all need sneakers or something. So I bought the team then, which was about five of us, red high tops. And so now the thing is everybody, when you come on board, you get your red high tops, even the board has them. And uh, on Fridays, a lot of us wear them. I wear them sometimes in between if my I can't I can't be in my heels for another minute. I put my red high tops on and walk around the bank. And I'm, so you never know who you'll find in red high tops at the bank. But uh, it's just part of, I think, an idea that we are bankers and we know what our job is as bankers. But we're also um, human and we like to have a little bit of fun and joke around. Outstanding. Well, I've loved this interview. It just went by so fast and I, I really value your time. I know how busy you are. I just have a couple more questions. Oh, you're one, fine. Is, one is, I'm a banker. I heard this interview and I want to start a bank. What advice do you have? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't is not the good I is not the good answer, by the way. I knew you weren't gonna let me say that. I, uh, I I actually was so lucky because Sarah, the one, the woman who came out of retirement to help on our marketing side and everything and, and everything she did and does, uh, she took me to an extremely venerated and well-known banker who started a lot of banks, been involved in a lot of banks, and took me to him early on and said, talk to him and see if you really want to do this. And uh, he, he after we talked a little while, he said, well, I can tell you, uh, I can tell you, I can't talk you out of this you're going to do it. But it's but if you have a niche and you're very clear about what your niche is, you can still be successful opening a, a new bank in, in the United States. And, uh, and he said, you have a niche. So I, I realized that we did. So I would tell anyone that they have to be very clear about what their niche is. Now, I'll tell you, you're still marketing around that and expressing that and how you profile that. That's still a struggle, but you have to be clear day to day about what your niche is. And uh, I think you can do it. And um, depending on your niche, you might find that the regulations aren't even written in ways that are helpful to what you're trying to achieve, but maybe over time that'll change too. Um, but uh, don't give up. Well, you haven't, and you've been incredibly successful. And I know that you always want more because you want to help more people. But congratulations on what you've done, Lauren. It's just phenomenal. Well, you're very kind. And I want to thank you for being um, encouraging. You might have laughed after you hung up the phone, but being encouraging early on about the need and the opportunity that there is for, um, you know, not changing banking as a whole, but but positioning community banking for the future because it's so important. And uh, thanks for encouraging me the way you did.
You bet. Thanks for your time, Lauren. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Jack Rants with Modern Bankers and my great guest, Lauren Sparks. This and every program is brought to you by our great friends at RelPro and Vertical IQ. Join us next time for more special guests bringing you marketing, sales, and leadership insights and ideas that will provide your bank or credit union with that competitive edge you need to succeed in 2023 and beyond. This LinkedIn Live show is also a podcast, and maybe that's where you're hearing this. Subscribe to our podcast, Jack Rants with Modern Bankers, and get the latest episodes every single week. Don't forget, leave us a review too. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and several others. Now, visit our website too, themodernbanker.com, for more information. And don't forget to sign up for our public library. It's completely free, and there are absolutely a ton of great resources there podcasts, past videos, ebooks, and several others. You can do that at themodernbanker.com slash public library. That's themodernbanker.com slash public library. And don't forget, whether it's an interview with Lauren Sparks, going about your day-to-day -day business, never forget that today is a great day and make it a great client day.